If you remain standing for the reading of God's holy word, we're in Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 10, and then all the way through chapter 7, 1 through 12. Ecclesiastes 6, verse 10, verse through 7, verse 12. Hear now God's holy word. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity, and what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is the wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Well, it's good to be back. I was away on the West Coast and uh, don't like flying on a plane, but uh, the Lord preserved me and I'm back. And so it's good to see you guys. A lot of new faces and maybe it's because of the holiday weekend. I thought it would be actually a lot less uh, full on this holiday weekend. But if you're new here for the first time or you're visiting family, welcome in the name of the Lord. Well, if you're like me, you enjoy a good thriller. Uh, One of the more anxiety-driven parts of watching a thriller, though, or reading a a thriller, um, is when someone nefarious, up to no good, is chasing after somebody else. And you know the scene. You can imagine the scene where a man is being chased in a busy alley or street, and every door he turns up to, it's locked. And we're rooting for him to find someone that could help him and just let him in. But over and over, it seems like there is no escape. Well, in the book of Ecclesiastes, Koheleth, who is the author of Ecclesiastes, or the preacher as it's literally translated in English, he's looking for an escape route from the meaningless of life, from the perplexing frustrations of life in this world. And since this is is his autobiography of sorts, it seems that he has already found the answer, but he doesn't want to just blurt out the answer without narrating his harrowing journey through life. It's almost as if he wants you to go through the alleys and the narrow streets with him to remind you of all the locked doors that life seemingly offers, but always disappoints never truly satisfying or fulfilling you. Some of you here today might be feeling this way too. You, you'd, you're somewhat exhausted from all the locked doors and all the misleading paths, and somewhere inside of your heart you're screaming, I just, I just need the solution right now. And I'm with you. I assure you, I'm, I'm with you. I understand that. And surely King Solomon, our our preacher in this book, understands this too. And it's almost like he is saying, trust me, a lot of this sounds like doom and gloom. But trust the journey. Come with me as we explore life's complexities. You're, You're going to experience all my dead ends, all my locked doors. But stay. Stay through the end when everything could be explained and the solution revealed. And sort of like a good thriller writer, then, he is taking his time and setting up the scene. He's including every tense bit 
so that we could truly be absorbed in his world and perception. And so if you have your Bibles, please keep them open. In chapter 6, verse 10, he begins part two in his autobiographical narration, starting in verse 10 of chapter 6, about godly advice for the deeper categories of life. He gave his first part introduction, and now here's pivoting to part two. We're going to spend the bulk of our time in chapter 7, verse 1 through 12, a series of short proverbs that give you a view from the sky of the ongoing battle between wisdom and folly. But here, in chapter 6, verse 10 through 12, we have three short verses that serve as a segue from part 1 to part 2. Namely, that when life gets really frustrating, there really isn't any point trying to waste words while you nitpick through the details of your problems. This is what he's saying in these verses. Have you ever felt that way? Where you're overthinking, and then guess what? You're overthinking, and then you're overthinking, and then it's 2 a.m., and then it's 3 a.m., and you have to get up at 6 a.m., and you're going through this, and it's an endless cycle, and you're not getting a lot of sleep, and you're overthinking, you're thinking about the perplexing things in your life. Perhaps some of you, from what classes to to take next quarter if you're a student? Some of you, why your communications are getting more difficult with family members. Why your boss is so bossy. I hope that's not me. Why the experience of raising an infant seems like the pinnacle of life, but simultaneously the bottomless pit of life all at the same time. So I've been told. You might have said or heard said, I can't express what I'm actually going through at a place like a church. And so I know many people that admit to me, and so I went to another church, and I was disappointed yet again, and so I went to another church, and it just seems like every church that I go to, no one can really share or are afraid to share or it's not welcome to share all the complex things that is in our hearts, all the uh, tangled up things in my mind. And so I come to a Sunday worship service, I sing the songs, I might even have a smile on my face, but yet when I get in my car and I go back home, life's complexities are still there, and I feel alone in not being able to share those things. These are the things Solomon, the preacher king, is trying to get at. In these verses, one theologian referenced Martin Luther's quote of an old German proverb that summarizes what's in these verses, chapter 6, verse 10 to 12. The old German proverb says, as things have been, so they still are, and as things are, so they will be. Basically, what Solomon continues to say, there's definitely nothing new under the sun, But back to the passage, Solomon understands the frustration that life on earth, things on earth, just repeat, repeat, and repeat. And if you're thinking, this sounds like the author says the same things over and over again, well, you're right. This is part of the effort of the author to convey these frustrating lessons from life. And when you're struggling with some of the more existential things of living in this world, you don't just have a good think through for an hour and say, I got it. I had my coffee, I had some alone time, and I just figured it out. No, most of us, if not all of us, it takes our whole lives contemplating the deeper mysteries and complexities of life. And Solomon, again, is trying to help you. He's saying, come with me and let me help you navigate these thoughts forming in your mind. And Solomon is in the part of his autobiography that he's owning up to complaining about all this. But there is definitely no use in trying to argue these things with God. And see what he says at the end of verse 10. And that is that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. Listen to Phil Riken who notes, the one stronger is Almighty God. And that sometimes people do try to argue with God, like Job, for example. But usually they come to regret it. After God answered him out of the world when Job had to confess, I have uttered what I don't understand, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. That's from Job chapter 42. But we can sympathize with Job and and Solomon, since we've all, all of us, we've tried this before, uttering and complaining about the things that we just don't understand. 
And Solomon is saying doing so endlessly is meaningless, but it's also part of the journey, he notes. But as we trust in God and his word, things that we perceive and learn about can come into beautiful focus then. I know a lot of us have experienced that. It's not overnight, but eventually things start to get into focus. And we say, this is, thank you for just a little bit more comprehension of the things of life. Because certainly there must be a better path than going through life with unanswered frustrations and questions. And so he has his introduction in part two, and it segues now into a series of Proverbs in chapter seven. Solomon uh, goes into what we can easily summarize as his better than Proverbs. And this is just overall this battle between living in godly wisdom or living in utter folly. And if you know it in verse 1 through 12 in chapter 7, you can underline six better than statements. We probably don't have time to go over every one, but you could just visually look at all the better than or better is statements. And although the categories revolve around two opposites, wisdom and folly, there's a central kind of topic that, that keeps coming up in these verses. It's on the notion of death. And so one scholar notes that there are four sections. If you look in verse 1 through 12 in in chapter 7, and he notes his four categories as this. And I'll repeat these as I go along. But number one, the meaning of life and death. Number two, the meaning of wise rebuke and foolish laughter. Number three, waiting patiently as we look ahead at what God will do. And then we'll conclude, number four, a summary statement on the value of wisdom. So let's go to number one, the meaning of life and death. Look at your Bibles in chapter 7, verse 1 through 4. A good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death and the day of birth, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind. And the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Of course, many of us know precious ointment in the ancient world was very costly. But the first better than in this passage says a good name, a name marked by good character and integrity, is worth more than what riches could buy in any century. I like the turn of phrase Phil Riken uses when he wrote, Koheleth calls us to wear the cologne of good character. This preacher king calls us to wear the cologne of good character. You've seen this in your life, haven't you? Regardless of someone's perfume or cologne, when you're around someone with godly character and faithfulness, there's just something about them that you're pleasantly drawn to. There's many of us here who I could list as examples. But of course, this is not a competition or of course anything to boast about. But when we quote unquote smell the aroma of Christ on you, and that reflects out in your character. That's such an uplifting thing to be around. I think we need to tell each other that more often. And that's why you'll never replicate church through the live stream, right? And again, there's some good reasons why people need to stream. But oh, to be in the presence of God together here, and to be around those with the cologne or perfume of good character and Someone with this good character would never want to pull attention towards themselves, but that is what is so humbling to see. As one said, make a good name, not for yourself, but for Jesus. Make a good name, not for yourself, but for Jesus. We could apply that in thousands of different uh, ways in in front of your family, in front of your friends, in front of your your neighborhood in front of your coworkers, make a good name, but not so that people will say, oh, he's an upstanding man or woman, but you're doing so for Jesus. May your attraction to your good name point us to someone far greater, someone better than. And for our youth age or college age years, it's never too early to pray for God's guidance in this. God, help me to make a good name, not so that I am applauded or praised, but that people can get a sense of Christ. Now with this next proverb, is your death truly better than your birth? (laughs) I admit that the first four verses, there's a lot of confusing kind of things to unpack. 
The scholars note that in the Proverbs, he can exaggerate with hyperbolic language to get this deeper point across. But at the end of the day, if you're a believer in our Lord and Savior, then we say thousands of years after Solomon, then yes, your death is actually better than your birth. The Apostle Paul takes note of this in his letter to the Philippians. Many of us can recall, oh, far better to be with the Lord. As much as we want to do ministry here, to be around our friends and family, oh, far better to be with the Lord. And if you follow Solomon's logic, far better to finally be freed from the anguish of the vanity of vanities. Now, I don't think Solomon is simply being morbid here, but he is pointing towards something better than, remember? And for the sake of time, for the the rest of these opening verses, there seems to be some golden nuggets to dig up here in what he was trying to convey, because at first look, this seems mad depressing, almost very discouraging. But I agree with some theologians I was reading that state that there is a level of intentional, sober thinking, as he says here in these first verses, when you attend a funeral, when you attend a wake, there's something intentional there. You sit for an hour or maybe several hours supporting your friends or loved ones, but you also internally think about life. You contemplate death. As Solomon is saying, when you're only feasting, you try to drown out the noise of deeper thinking to just simply temporarily free yourself of the worries and anxieties of life. And he's not saying that laughter and feasting is a bad or sinful thing, amen. But those that want to walk in wisdom, he says, take advantage of the more contemplative or perhaps even the darker, sadder moments of life instead of the fools that always have to cover their sorrow with distractions. And I think this was hard for me to read the first actually couple of times. But as the the verses take hold of you as a whole, There's such good, deeper meaning here for everyday living. I think it's hard to read this because in our day and age, we don't like talking about death. We don't like thinking about death. I don't like talking about death, if I'm honest with you. I don't like thinking about death either. And I've had the privilege to attend many wakes and memorial service burials in the last couple of months and even the last couple of years here at Westminster or with close friends, some services that I had to lead, of course, and some that I got to just sit back and contemplate life and, yes, death, too. Much of those times with tears. We, of course, live in a society that wants to talk about not dying, staying youthful, never about aging. We don't want that. We want AI to develop something where we just keep having birthdays forever. We have a billion dollar industry out there and marketing campaigns to prevent us from ever taking grasp of death or even aging. But Solomon is paving the way for us to think and talk about death in a healthier way, dare we say a wiser way. And so we need to come to grips of what is better than. But if you're fearful, if you're anxious here about death, Perhaps it's better to come to grips of the reality of our imminent deaths, all of us, and prepare for them in a better than way. Some of you learned of the letters C.S. Lewis wrote to people that were fans or just correspondents all across the world. They have been collected and published for our edification, truly. And one letter that is pretty famous, he wrote to Mary Willis Shelburne, He knew that she was very fearful of of her perhaps very imminent death. And so the title of this excerpt is How to Rehearse for Death and How to Diminish Fear. This is from June 17th, 1963. He wrote to this lady who was fearful. He said, pain is terrible, but surely you need not have fear as well. Can you not see death as the friend and deliverer? It means stripping off that body which is tormenting you, like taking off a hair shirt or getting out of a dungeon. What is there to be afraid of? You have long attempted, and none of us does more, a Christian life. Your sins are confessed and absolved. Has this world been so kind to you that you should leave it with regret? 
that there are better things ahead than any we leave behind. And he goes on to say, remember, though we struggle against things because we are afraid of them, it is often the other way around. We get afraid because we struggle. And so he says, are you struggling, resisting? Don't you think our Lord says to you, peace, child, peace, relax, let go. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Let go, I will catch you. Do you trust me so little? And he encourages her with this. Of course, this may not be the end. She might not die imminently. But then he says, then make it a good rehearsal. And he signs this, yours, and like you, a tired traveler near the journey's end, Jack, which is his long nickname amongst close ones. What was striking about this letter, I found out, was that it was written five months before his own death. But when I was reading this letter, what a refreshing way to look at life, but also death and what is to come after death. There's nothing to fear when we know where we're going, when we know who is waiting to catch us, to bring us into everlasting light. You can't think of anything better than, than being with Jesus. We still grieve on this earth, of course. But I can't tell you how reassuring this all is. Fear not, for God is with you and is waiting for you. Life is not too good that you can't leave it behind for Jesus. Now, we could have made the whole sermon about these verses, but we must move on to the remainder of the passage. But this was, number one, the meaning of life and death. And then now, number two, the meaning of wise rebuke and foolish laughter. Look at verse 5 through 6. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. I think this portion is much easier to get a hold of, and we'll go a little quicker with these. But we don't know exactly what he was referring to as the song of fools, as in literal merrymaking over fermented beverages, or simply a picture of people you have around you. They'll never correct, they'll never admonish you, and never help you in that way, and only talk sweet nothings to you 24-7. To illustrate this in a very insignificant topic, I remember hearing about a professional NFL quarterback who had all the talent in the world. I mean, literally, he could run like the wind, he could throw miles away, not literally. But what was really interesting about him was he refused to let his coaches show him any videotape of the previous weeks of any of his mistakes. He was like, I don't want anything negative to come into my view, so please don't show me anything, just show me the highlights. Just show me those perfect touchdown passes. Oh, my wonderful long runs and so forth and so on. Well, he had a very short-lived career. It was like a flash in the pan. And other than his injuries, perhaps his attitude of never wanting to be corrected was his downfall. You know, the ones I hold close and near to me and have access to me pretty much at any time during the day or at night of those that I can trust my life with, to cheer me on, to encourage me, to edify me, are the ones that I invite to also correct me, to rebuke me, to speak truth and love with whatever they're seeing in me that is off. I need that, I I need them. Or I'll start to be tempted to only listen to flattery, flattery, and yeah, I'll, I'll say even just words of encouragement can be limiting if that's all I want to hear. Or if my friends only want to be goofy around me and just be merry and laugh all the time, there are certainly good times to have of all of that. But that can't be all in our friendship. As the metaphor goes with thorns under a pot, oh, that, that might burst into flames, but only for a short time. But if that's all we accept, then that's vanity of vanities and ultimately meaningless. Moving on quickly then to our third section, verse 7 through 10, waiting patiently as we look ahead at what God will do. Verse 7, surely oppression drives the wise into madness and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry for anger lodges in the heart of fools. 
Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. I'm not a very patient person about certain things. I won't go over that list with you right now out of sheer embarrassment, but I can freely admit that I can be impatient. And I do think part of my, if you call it gift set or whatever, if you can call it that, is that I like to be a visionary sort of person in regards to leadership and planning and thinking ahead. But often, I'll freely admit, I lack the patience needed because I want that picture in my mind and in my heart right now. Wait, I wasn't supposed to go into the details. But anyway, that, that's my impatience. And I can also struggle with being angry, not all the time, of course, but it rears its head every so often. This one I really don't like to admit. The late Jerry Bridges wrote a book on respectable sins, and there are certain sins where you're like, yes, I struggle with that, and you're almost proud to. But there are certain besetting sins where you're saying, I, I don't want to say that, let alone from a pulpit. But I could struggle with anger. And so this was poignant for me, these verses. I don't like it, of course, but it's part of who I am that I'm needing to constantly lift up to the Lord. And much of the anger is expressed internally. And so I like this image of something getting lodged in the heart, as he says. I enjoyed watching this video of a city worker who goes around unplugging clogged up sewer drains around busy roadways where cars can't get through because there's this flooding because of this clog and all the debris after a big storm or flash flood, you know, it just all gets stuck at this one point. And he spends maybe half an hour, maybe, I don't know, you know, with internet, it, it could be 10 hours and it just shows it like in five minutes. But he's digging with his hands and he's removing tree branches and mud and all sorts of litter and who knows what until this very satisfying point of the scene unfolds where the water finally has a place to escape. The next time I struggle with anger or impatience even, I want to recall that image in my mind, that this is what is happening inwardly when I let loose and all these things and I just don't care. Oh, the, the debris is building up. And so when thinking big things and looking to the future, surely it's good not to dwell on the past, he says, and only living in the former days, but be patient at what God will be doing with all those dreams in your life, but also your sanctification, your gradual gospel transformation and your mortification of your sin, that, he start, that he, whatever he started in you, he will bring it to final completion. That as Paul says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Be patient, realizing and again and again that God has a plan and will work things out in the end. Certainly Solomon is thinking this way. And finally, number four, a summary statement on the value of wisdom. A summary statement on the value of wisdom. Let's read these last two verses. Wisdom is good with an inheritance and advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. I'm pretty much kind of running out of time here, but much like money is used as an emergency kind of source, everyone is told to save a certain amount of emergency funds, a lot of us can't do it, but that's the advice, because you never know for this and that, for the ups and downs and the unexpected of life. Solomon is like, likening godly wisdom like that to an answer to life's A through Z's. There is a distinct practical advantage when one possesses literal money and, and savings, of course. But there is a distinct spiritual advantage when one possesses in increasing fashion the pursuit of the wisdom of God revealed to us by the scriptures. And so if we find ourselves rather allergic to the Bible, if we're allergic to praying and reading through and praying through the Bible, oh, the larger the distance grows in the heart of the ways and the wisdom of our great God. So I think he's saying guard your spiritual walk by pursuing the fear of the Lord, by pursuing life and union to God through Christ our Savior. Oh, abide in me and I will abide in you, Jesus said. I'm going to give one more football example, all right? 
The NFL starts next Sunday. I'm not excited. I am. But some of you talk with me, and we get very excited. I get very excited when rooting on Chicago sports. I don't know why, but I follow England and the World Cup and things like that. We just get very excited when you're seeing two opponents in opposition going after it and competing. We get very excited. I remember a World Cup a couple years ago. I was at the Hoons. They love soccer. I love soccer. I love England. Deb baked all these cookies. And every time I got stressed, I went to the kitchen. I grabbed two more. And I was just, I was just really stressed. And I think they lost. I don't know. It wasn't good. But we get so intense, don't we, about battles. Solomon is portraying two opposite polar things, wisdom and folly. And I'm first to admit that I'll get so much more intentional about following my favorite sports team in that competition than thinking about wisdom and folly. I'm not saying it's absolutely not there in my life, but if I want to be honest with you, well, sometimes it's on the back burner, isn't it? To pursue the life of the fear of the Lord in godly wisdom, to cherish what we read in 1 Corinthians, that Christ is the full embodiment of wisdom, and that naturally and organically, when we are living in union to Christ, oh, the life of folly seems like such an erroneous thing that we just don't want anything to do with. Much like, oh, I want the Bears to win. I want to, to see the competition. I want to see them victorious, not just by one point, but by a thousand points. And when it comes to living life compared to folly versus wisdom, I need to pray for my own heart. Oh, God, give me something greater still. Not, not so that I could look down on other believers. Not so that I can wear a badge and, and keep adding badges to my coat to say, look how wise I am. But to say, oh, this is better than this is better than. And we would be remiss to not point to Jesus at the end of this, at the end of all days, at the end of all life's perplexing pursuits and striving. Oh, there is a better than. And that's Jesus. And when I was preparing the sermon, I, I just was reminded of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. As one of my Seminary professors would always tell us, oh, Hebrews is summarized as better than. Jesus is better than. Jesus is better than the prophets, the priests, the kings, and so forth and so on. He is better than. And so when you are stuck, and again, most of us might not be able to share these things with others, but when you're stuck or when there's something clogged there, in the spiritual heart. The goal then is not to say, let me just bring out my resolutions book and I'm just gonna just get better at this. The solution though is to say, well, help me be so saturated in the true better than, in Christ alone. And I guarantee, if done in faith, even in the weakest faith, God honors this. God has these loving arms to catch you, even in this lifetime, to teach you, as I said a couple of weeks ago, to enroll in the school of Jesus, to be educated by him, to remain in him and he, as he remains in us over and over. Oh, this is the better life. Even in darkness of grieving and mourning, even when people just try to cover things to satisfy over and over, it's never too late to say, well, let me reorient myself back to Jesus who is better than. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this book that is very perplexing even in itself to us often. But when we can get glimpses of what Solomon has learned through his life, and that he is taking us through the alleys of locked doors and confusion. Thank you, Lord, that we can go on this journey with him. Because a lot of this, even though it happened almost 3,000 years ago as he was writing this, still so um, specifically applies to what we go through in the wrestling of our hearts and minds. 
I pray that our whole church at Westminster, even our visitors here streaming or here in person, uh, that we can enroll in the tutelage of the Son, Jesus, who is the fulfillment and the embodiment truly of wisdom. So thanks be to you, God, for your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.